Good day to all. Welcome to another session of Dentistry and More. We'll be continuing with the question paper discussion on oral medicine and radiology. So this time the topics will be discussed are oral ulcerative disorders, dermatological disorders and temporomandibular joint disorders. So the first topic is the ulcerative lesions of the oral cavity in that the long essay that is frequently asked is the definition of ulcer, the classification of ulcers, then the description of the etiology, clinical features, diagnosis and management of recurrent after stomatitis. So once you are going about with the definition of ulcer, there are two definitions that have been given. One is from the Burkitt's oral medicine textbook and also the Ravi Kiran Ongol has given this beautiful de description of uh, what is an ulcer. So I prefer it's better to describe the definition of an ulcer from Ravi Kiran Ongol textbook of oral medicine and radiology itself. The ulcer is defined as the breach in the continuity of the surface epithelium of the skin or the mucous membrane to involve the underlying connective tissue as a result of micromolecular cell death of the surface epithelium or its traumatic removal. And the classification can be based on the mode of onset and the clinical presentation. This has been given in, again in the textbook of oral medicine by Rebigir and Ongol himself. In that the def uh, classification is given under these subheadings that is single ulcers and the multiple ulcers then you have the chronic multiple ulcers and to that each conditions that are seen or the ulcers that are presented as such same classification is also being given in Burkitt's old medicine itself so even you can go about in that classification given so and there and the second classification that you can go by is based on the etiology that is whether it's traumatic infections and drug induced ulcers associated with blood dyscariasis, immune mediated, oral ulcers associated with the dermatological disorders followed by the association with the GI disorders, the neoplastic oral ulcers and the ulcers of the un uncertain etiology. So moving on to the next part of the question that is what is the recurrent after ulcer as such it can be asked as a long essay it can be asked as a short essay also. So once a framework how to go about the framework for answering the recurrent after ulcer when asked. So what do you mean by recurrent after ulcers? It is nothing other than recurring ulcers that are confined to the oral mucosa in patients with no other signs of disease. So these can be presented with multiple round or ovoid ulcers which are generally with well-defined borders as well as an erythematous halo surrounding the periphery of the ulcer. That is how it is being presented clinically. Now moving on to the etiology of or the reasons as to why recurrent after ulcers occur. It is made may cause due to hereditary reasons, traumatic reasons also, deficiencies such as that of vitamin B deficiencies or the iron deficiencies as such. And then you have the psychological factors, endocrine disorders, allergic conditions, infections, blood dyscariasis, drugs, GI diseases, urological diseases, dermatological disorders as well as an immunological origin too. So this is how the after ulcer presentation looks like. You can see in this case itself, there is an erythematous halo. Okay, And in the center portion, you can see the denuded surface. The clinical presentation, the patient exhibits a symptom that is a burning sensation is presented, which appears to have be around 2 to 48 hours before the ulcer appears then during the initial periods a localized area of erythema develops first within the few first few hours and then a small white papule forms are seen which ulcerates and then gradually enlarges over to the next 48 to 72 hours so the ulcers they are having a well-defined borders so they are regular and well-defined borders they have and they are found to be rimmed by an erythematous halo and the ulcer is covered by a yellowish grey fibrinous pseudo membrane then the number and the size of the ulcers are based on the type of the recurrent aphthous ulcers so there are three types in recurrent aphthous ulcers that you may know of it is the minor aphthous ulcer then the major aphthous ulcer and the herpetiform ulcers you can go through the text in, again in the textbook of oral medicine by Ravikiran Ongol himself he is given in the chapter oral ulcerative diseases under that in the aphthous ulcers there are the three types that has been given in the clinical presentation itself so the other names also you must know because sometimes they can ask what is Michelix ulcer that is nothing other the other name or the synonym for minor aphthous ulcer and certain ulcer means it's uh, the other name for ma major aphthous ulcer so you must know the difference between each of these three types that is the minor aphthous as well as major and the 
and herpetiform ulcers. So, in the minor, based on the size itself, it is found to be around 2 to 4 mm in diameter. It has been presented with an ulcer which he heals without any scarring. Whereas, in the uh, and also in minor aphthous ulcers, it is found to be involving the non keratinized oral mucosa. Whereas, in the major aphthous ulcers, it is found to be uh, seen involved with the keratinized areas of the oral mucosa, such as that of the palate, the dorsum part of the tongue. And these ulcers are found to be, as the name suggests, major aphthous ulcer, major itself. So, it is a, found to be a larger in size ulcers and it is found to be healing for a longer duration of time and it heals around. 2 to 6 weeks with scarring. That is the difference between the minor and the major aphthous ulcers. So, the other third type is the herpetiform ulcers which you must alert about because herpetiform ulcers you must not suspect it as a ulcer that is related to herpes simplex virus infections. This is the third type of um, the aphthous ulcer. So, herpetiform why the name is suggested is because it is almost similarly representing or similar to that of the herpes simplex virus ulcer related uh, infections. So, so, the presentation is almost similar but at the same time it is found to be the cause is not under, underlying cause is not related to any viral infection there will be no prodromal symptoms as such in your herpetiform ulcers. It is already a feature of uh, aphthous ulcer as I have already undergone what is the etiology part. So, the etiology it can be related to any of the enlisted ones in the previous slide. So, in herpetiform, how it is presented is found to be crops of tiny pinhead ulcers which coalesce together and these are found to be occurring in both the mucosa that is in the keratinized mucosa as well as in the non-keratinized mucosa. And in these ulcers, these are found to be more painful and it can heal around within 10 days time and it can also immediately recur. So, these three types that is the minor, major as well as herpetiform ulcers you must know in and out. You should explain about it in your clinical features too. Then moving on to the ulcers. Uh, these ulcers are found to be occurring in the non-keratinized oral mucosa mostly in the buccal as well as the labial mucosa the aphthous ulcers and then these ulcers are found to be rarely occurring in the high heavily keratinized palate or gingiva. It is only found in the presentation in the major aphthous ulcers. Moving on to the uh, diagnosis of the recurrent aphthous stomatitis, it is mainly uh, based on the history as well as the clinical presentation of the ulcer. So, in order to rule out any blood dyskiriasis etiology, we can also undergo some hematological investigations for such cases. And then, how to manage the recurrent aphthous stomatitis? Primary goal is to uh, relieve the pain. So, symptom relief is primarily been done and then uh, go about for the secondary cause that is the a reduction in the recurrence as well as the maintenance of the remission. So, now what we go through is for the managing through topical application by using any topical corticosteroids or even antimicrobial mouthwashes. If in case the topical application fails, then we go for a systemic medication that is through prescribing any prednisone like corticosteroids. And then we also prescribe alternatives other than the corticosteroids, the levimazole or repamimide and thalidomide. Levimazole, the prescription that has been given is the 150 milligrams dosage daily for 3 consecutive days followed by a gap of 2 weeks then again repeat the same uh, for the next 3 days. This is almost done for around 6 times in such a way that you can uh, the patient has been prescribed around 18 number of tablets and it takes a time period of 3 months of therapy. And then Next is the uh, next um, drug that can be given is the repimamide, in which you prescribe 100 milligrams thrice daily for 7 to 14 days. Even another alternative for corticosteroids that can be given is the thalidomide, but due to the uh, toxicity and its uh, cost, this is least kind of preferably given. So moving on to the next chapter, that is the dermatological disorders. The short notes. The first question that can I ask frequently is the management of oral lichen planus. I think I have explained it about it in the red and white lesions itself chapter. And this is the same thing that has been given as a management protocol or the flow chart that has been given in the textbook of oral medicine by Ravikir and Angul. So you can go on, go through it in that chapter. And the next favorite question to be asked in the dermatological disorders is the ectodermal dysplasia. 
So ectodermal displaces as the name says ectodermal it affects the ectodermal origin structures. So it's a congenital defect that is seen in the structures of the ectodermal origin including the skin, hair, teeth, nails and sweat glands. And uh, this is found to be the etiopathogenesis it, and it is found to be arising from the X-linked recessive trait which is found to be a repressed expression of a gene in the X chromosome where, where the position is found to be around the Q13 and to Q21. So the cl classic features or the clinical features that you see in ectodermal dysplasia are these. The ones which I have highlighted in red, that definitely you have to uh, put it in your answer framework itself that you have to say that it is high, there is hypodontia, there is hypotrichosis and hypohydrosis. And the neonates, it's found to have, have they have clinically, they are presented with the excessive scaling of the skin as well as an unexplained pyrexia. Then they have sparse hair and eyebrows. They, they also presented with the frontal bossing, saddle nose, sunken cheeks, thick or averted lips, wrinkled and hyperpigmented skin around the eyes. When it comes to the oral manifestation, there is these are the features that is the anodontia seen, oligodontia seen, teeth is found to be malformed, there are missing molars, and when you see in the anterior portion itself, you can see that they are found to have a truncated conical crowns as well as shortened roots, and they have a dry mouth that is cirrostomia seen in these cases. And also, there's high palatal arch and a cleft palate also can be observed in such cases. Moving on to the management, it's highly based on the symptomatic relief. So, if the cases are found to be having uh, cirrostomia, then you go for prescribing pilocarpet 5 mg thrice daily and also salivary substitutes can be given. And in case of the truncated and the conical crowns or the, for the teeth or the malformed teeth, we uh, give manage such cases with placement of crowns as well as dental implants for the edentulous areas. So moving on to the next chapter, that is the temporomandibular joint disorders. So the one of the questions that can be asked as a short note is the trismus. So what do you mean by trismus? It's nothing other than a decreased uh, a mouth opening or a locked jaw. Also, it's caused due to the spasm of the muscles of mastication, which can cause the inability to uh, for the patient to open their oral cavity. And the normal mouth opening. Uh, range is found to be 35 to 45 millimeters for males and 40 to 60 millimeters in females. So the clinical presentation for trismus cases is with a painful jaw, decreased mouth opening, decreased lateral movement and also decreased protrusion of the mandible. So how do you manage such cases? These are the enlisted protocol that is the conservative therapy, then the physiotherapy, analgesics are prescribed, even muscle relaxants can be given and along with that is heat therapy as well as surgical therapy and trismus appliances can be uh, prescribed for such cases. So the next question that can be asked is a TMG dislocation. So what are the causes for TMG dislocation once asked you can mention that it is a forcible opening of the mouth by a blow on a jaw or it can be caused due to any dental extraction as well as when the patient uh, opens, their wide, opens their mouth wide open while yawning. So how does this occur, the TMJ dislocation, you can see in this diagrammatic representation. You can also draw the diagram also in this for this answer by stating that the condylar process of the mandible is found to be uh, abnormally, it is coming anteriorly placed over the, it crosses across the articular eminence. Normally, while opening, it should come up till the articular eminence itself. But in such cases of DMJ dislocation, it comes goes beyond the articular eminence and you can notice how it is presented here. So management is nothing other than manual reduction itself. Wherein you place your uh, fingers, that is your thumb portion, over to the posterior teeth of the uh, posterior teeth in the mandibular region, and then you guide the mandible by uh, pressing it uh, for upwards and backwards, so that you can bring back the condylar process of the mandible back to their glenoid fossa, that is back to the normal uh, position itself. So the rest of the topics will be continued for the next sessions. Thank you for your patient listening.